Christmas is a time of year when so many people travel all over the country to visit with friends and family. And I'm sure that some of you will be doing that this Christmas. There is something about the holidays and just getting together with friends and family. But there are also multitudes of travelers headed for other destinations. In fact, people from all over the world are arriving each day in the ancient village of Bethlehem. There, almost 2,000 years ago, a baby was born who was called Jesus. In this little village, groups of people will gather together just to listen to a pastor or a leader read the old familiar story from Luke's gospel. Also, this time of year, you can often hear them singing a song written by an American pastor who visited Bethlehem. Phillips Brooks was his name, and he was so touched and deeply moved that he went home after seeing Bethlehem, and he wrote the familiar carol, O Little Town of Bethlehem. The first Christmas required a long journey. In fact, the journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem was about 90 miles, which would take about 8 to 10 days, or maybe even longer when one of the travelers was nine months pregnant. We can all just imagine that. But there was a reason for the journey. Luke chapter 2 tells us the reason for the journey. It says, in those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinus was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. It sounds very matter of fact, but that's not, I imagine, the way that Mary and Joseph felt about it. In Mary's ninth month of pregnancy, Roman soldiers arrived in Nazareth to announce that the emperor had commanded a census. Everyone had to travel to the town where their family owned property so that the Romans could levy property taxes. And Joseph's family property was located in Bethlehem. So that is where he and Mary had to go. To Mary and Joseph, this was just one more example of Roman oppression. And it messed up all their plans. Many probably had a mid- Mary probably had a midwife she was familiar with there in Nazareth. She surely hoped to give birth surrounded by family and friends. Now, in the very last month, she was forced to make a trip that would be dangerous, costly, and uncomfortable at best. We aren't told of how Mary felt. Who knows how she felt? But it would be normal for Mary to think something like this. What is going on here? The angel appeared to me months ago, and I know that this baby will be nothing less than the Messiah. But now everything is going wrong. At the worst possible time, I have to head off on this dangerous trip. What is God doing? Have you ever felt that way toward God? Please tell me that I'm not the only one. Have you ever been so disappointed or afraid that all you could do was cry, could do was cry out, what are you doing, God? You were hoping for a promotion, but instead you got laid off. You prayed for healing, but the sickness got worse. You thought you had found a great relationship, but now you've been left all alone. When we look at the circumstances of life, we often wonder, what is God doing? The problem is that we are looking at circumstances. We are looking at what we can see with our physical eyes. The truth is that reality is so much more than what is visible to the human eye. What we can't see is actually the important reality of it all. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, it explains that faith is the evidence of things not seen. And 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, it says, we walk by faith and not by sight. I believe that is the way that Mary and Joseph walked the road to Bethlehem. That was their journey. They walked by faith and not by sight. They saw far beyond the dusty road because they looked with eyes of faith. Mary and Joseph knew that God was at work behind the scenes, bringing the fulfillment of prophecy. Micah chapter 5, verse 2, it records it. It says, But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Even though he was going to be a baby, his origins were from ancient times. Incredible word from Micah. The second thing is that was the route for the journey. Nothing is said about the long journey, but the most direct route Mary and Joseph might have taken went through Samaria on a route that is called the Way of the Patriarchs. 
it has that name because so much of the history of the Old Testament took place along that route. It's so neat. For example, this was the route that Abraham took when God promised to give the land to Abraham and his descendants forever. Along this route was a place where Jacob dreamed of angels ascending and descending a ladder to heaven. Mary and Joseph would have stopped to drink from a well that Jacob dug over a thousand years before. They would have passed the place where Joseph was buried and the place where Joshua fought the battle of Jericho. All these historical places along the way. This was also the road that Daniel traveled when he was led away into Babylonian captivity. This was the road that God's people traveled when they returned to their homeland to rebuild the temple. So much history just in this one trek. Mary and Joseph were traveling a route that was rich with the history of God's people, but all that, all that most people could see was a tired couple trudging along a, dress, a dusty road. They would have looked at Mary and Joseph and just seen another couple making their way to Bethlehem because of the Roman census. The miracle was what was on scene. How amazing to realize that God in the flesh was actually traveling this road of the patriarchs as a baby not yet born. The last leg of the route would have been the hardest of all. Jericho is the lowest city on the globe, the very lowest city. And Jerusalem and Bethlehem are situated right at the top of the hills. From Jericho's desert to Bethlehem is an uphill hike of 3,500 feet. The beautiful temple of Jehovah would have been visible in the far distance for many, many miles. Seen on the top of the hill. And every year, people from all over the world, they travel to visit the Jerusalem temple. Because this temple was the dwelling place of God on earth. Anyone who wanted to connect with God came to the temple. People who wanted to give thanks to God or to receive forgiveness from God had to travel to the temple. What the travelers could see with human eyes was a magnificent white structure representing God's presence on earth. What was on scene was the future of that temple. And just 70 years later, that magnificent building would lie in shambles and completely demolished by the Roman army. Completely demolished. What was on scene was that the baby that Mary carried would make that temple obsolete. Only Mary and Joseph could have known then that even then, God's presence had already moved from the temple to the, bod to the body of a tiny preborn baby. The very presence of God had already come to dwell in human flesh. And 30 years later, after Jesus' birth. Jesus told his disciples, if you have seen me, you have, you have seen the Father. Then Jesus explained, I am with you and will be in you. John chapter 14, verse 9. While Jesus was on earth, God's presence resided in him. And after his death and resurrection, God took up residence, not in a temple, but in every believer. That's why 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, it says, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have received from God. Don't you know that your body is now the temple? That's what Paul was talking to the Corinthians about. And people no longer have to travel to Jerusalem, thank the Lord, in order to connect to God. We don't have to make an annual trip to some temple in Jerusalem in order just to be able to connect with our God. Because of Jesus, God has come to dwell with us and in us. But no one could foresee all these things during the 10-day trip from Nazareth to Bethlehem. Luke chapter 2, verse 6 to 7, it gives us the result of the journey. It says, well, they were there. The time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. What was seen was an exhausted young couple. Forced to take shelter in a barn. What was seen was the birth of one more Jewish baby, born in less than ideal circumstances to poverty-stricken parents who were far away from home. What was on scene was that God had entered time and space. What was on scene was that God had sent his only begotten son to earth so that anyone who believes in him could be saved. The night that Jesus was born, Mary and Joseph could not hear the angels singing. They couldn't see the wise men following that distant star. 
that night while they were swallowing their new baby, God was at work behind the scene. They may not have seen the things that would happen, but certainly they did see the Messiah that night. Soon the shepherds would arrive with their amazing story about a choir of angels. The wise men would come with valuable gifts later on. And Joseph would be warned in a dream, and they would flee to Egypt in order to avoid a murderous king. Later, Mary and Joseph would return to Nazareth, and the next 25 years or so would be surprisingly normal and uneventful. We tend to focus on the years when Jesus was teaching and healing and performing miracles. We tend to focus on those days. We have so much recorded about it, but we forget that before those years, Jesus lived a quiet, normal, small-town life. As a boy, Jesus submitted to his parents and obeyed them. As a young adult, Jesus apprenticed as a carpenter and then worked to help support his family. As far as we know, the first 30 years were mostly mundane and ordinary, but during those years, God was working behind the scenes to set the stage for Jesus' history. If we can only see it, that's the way that life always is. It seems like our daily life is just daily. As far as what we can see, things just go along in a normal way with nothing important happening. Maybe there is something you've been waiting and praying about for years, but it's something you've been waiting and praying about for years, but it seems like nothing's happening. We need to realize that what we see with our eyes is not the end of the story. What we can see is not as important as what is unseen. Even when we can't see it, we need to remember that behind the scenes, God is always working. When the circumstances you see around you look hopeless, remember that God is always working behind the scenes. Remember that Joseph and Mary's journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem. Remember that the people who passed them on the road to Bethlehem saw only worn-out travelers plodding along a, on a forced march because the oppressive Roman government demanded a census. That's what people see. They didn't suspect when they looked at Mary and Joseph, hey, she's carrying the Messiah. In fact, in their own town in Nazareth, there was much, uh, I wouldn't say persecution, but looks that they would get. Because what was on scene, people didn't believe. Remember that the people who passed Mary and Joseph on the road to Bethlehem had no idea that they were walking past the Son of God. They had no idea God was doing his greatest work behind the scenes. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18, it says, We fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. That's what we choose to fix our eyes on. Remember that God is always working, whether seen or unseen. There was a king who had all this world could afford. The thing that he loved most, however, was to laugh. How many loves a good laugh? Good laugh. Once, while being entertained, a jester came along wishing to join in the festival of activities and also wishing to perform for the king. I mean, who wouldn't want to perform for the king? So his opportunity came, and he put the best comical show together that you have ever seen in front of this king. And the king had never laughed so hard. Once the activity was all over, the king wanted to hire this jester to be his personal jester. Once hired, the king in humor handed him a small stick and said, You are the most foolish man alive, he said. When you find someone more foolish than you, then give them this stick. Interesting words from the king. So, after many years had passed, all of a sudden the king became sick and he was laying on his deathbed ready to go at any moment. And he called for his jester. He wanted to have one more laugh before he died. When the jester was through, he asked to speak to the king personally. Once alone with the king, the jester asked, King, where are you going? The king responded, on a far journey. The jester asked again, and how do you plan to get there? Again, again the king responded, I don't know. Then the jester pulled the stick from his back pocket and handed it to the king. The king was stunned and asked why he had given him the stick. 
The jester replied, King, today I have found a more foolish man than I. For you see, I only trifled with the things of life, but you have trifled with the things of eternity. The journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem is significant of our life's journey, of where we are in our own walk with God. There are uncertainties and no doubt bumps in the road. There are scenic views along the way, picture-worthy settings. We are faced with forks in the road when we need to decide which way is best to go. And there are things which are seen and things that are unseen. And throughout this journey called life, there are three ways that people seek for God along this road. Number one is a way of control. Like King Herod, he never could find Jesus because he was looking in the wrong place. The only reason why King Herod wanted to find Jesus was so that he could destroy him so he could stay on the throne. Nobody was going to dethrone him. He was going to be king. And the fact is that some want to maintain the illusion of control they have over their lives, and they will push and attempt to destroy whatever, try to get in their way. The second way is sharing. Some will discover God on their life's journey like the shepherds who were told about him. But I would not wait for an angelic choir to come and tell your neighbor about the Savior. God expects us to do the sharing. Some experience God that way. And the third way is that out of seeking. Others will find God because they are already searching like the wise men who followed a star. It is suggested that they were Babylonians who inherited the prophecies of Daniel from their ancestors. These were astrologers called Magi in the royal co court of the king of Persia. They were unexpected. Just catch this. They were unexpected worshipers of Jesus. But they were always seeking. There are people who will find their way to God simply by seeking for life's answers. People who will walk into our church services just to find out what it's about. People who will attend a dinner we are hosting, not because they are hungry for food, but because they are hungry for truth. People that come unexpectedly. They weren't expecting the wise men to come with the gifts that they had. We can all fit our way into one of those three categories about how we came to God if we really try to think back about it. How do we come? Or are we invited? Or do we just start searching for truth because we're so hungry? And unfortunately, there are those that seek control of their own life and choose, choose a different route, choose a fork in the road, if you will, that doesn't lead to following Christ. My question tonight is, are you a Herod, a shepherd, or a wise man? Are you a controller, a sharer, or a seeker? Our journey to him was made possible by his journey to us. And he's thankful for that. So thankful that he made the trek to us. If we could all stand. This Christmas, I pray that you are not focused that you were focused not only on his journey to us, but on your journey to him. And uh, Joseph and Mary, you know, they had quite a trek on their hands. I can just imagine her being nine months pregnant and all of a sudden finding out that they have to go to a distant land. To them, I mean, 90 miles in the car isn't so bad, but 90 miles by donkey and foot is little ways. <laughs> We really break down the story of what happened on this journey to Bethlehem and all the things that they would have passed by. Maybe they got thirsty along the way and drank from Jacob's well. You know, they looked over and they seen where the Jericho used to stand in all of its glory. You know, and uh, they could just imagine themselves envisioning Abraham's footsteps alongside theirs. Back to all these patriarchs that followed them. There have been many people that have gone on this journey throughout the years, since the beginning of time. Many have come looking, and some end up looking in the wrong place, putting their attention elsewhere. And uh, this Christmas, 
Christmas gives us that opportunity to find our focus. It's very easy to get off track with the hustle and bustle of Christmas that we can lose sight of what this whole journey is all about. It wasn't about a guy in a red suit. It wasn't about gifts underneath a Christmas tree. It wasn't about even putting up a Christmas tree. It wasn't about the kind of lights that you went out to Canadian Tire and bought and hung up on your, the front of your house. You know, it wasn't about the busyness of all of this. But it was simply about a birth that changed the world. Who knew that one small infant could change everything? No wonder why King Herod wanted to kill him. He knew what the prophecy said. That one day, this baby would die for the sins of the world and give us an opportunity to walk on a journey towards him. I was just wondering if we can lift up our hands at this time and just thank him for what this Christmas is all about. It may have been over, it may have been close to 2,000 years since his birth and since his death and ascension. But it doesn't negate the fact that he is still just as real today as he was when he was laying in that in that manger. Man, can we just worship him for a moment for who he is and what he's done in our life? God, you are so worthy of all praise and all glory here today. God, and you have set us on a journey, Lord, since our birth. God, to seek and to find you, Lord. Your word says to seek. Lord, if we seek you, Lord, then you will be found. God, if we seek you with all of our heart, God, so that is what we choose to do here today. God, we choose to seek you out, Lord. We choose, oh God, to seek your face. Lord, drawing ever so close to you, Lord. Lord, we pray right now in Jesus' name that as we gather around, Lord, on Christmas Day, God, and on Christmas Eve, Lord, with our family and with our friends, oh God, and Lord, as we focus upon what this season is about, Lord, I pray, God, that you would bring us back to the attention of what it really is all about. God, your birth, Lord, your precious birth, Lord, that brought about a way of forgiveness of our sins, Lord, that brought about, Lord, freedom, God, and liberty in the Holy Ghost. Lord, we thank you, Jesus, for all that you've done for us, God, and all that you're going to do. Lord, we pray, Jesus, that you would allow others to see what this Christmas is about through our life. God, help the journey that we're on right now to be reflective of other people, Lord, into other people's lives. Help them, Lord, to see, God, what you're all about, what you're trying to do in our life. God, we will give you all the praise and all the glory. Amen. Amen. I know that I haven't been long, but I, uh, I feel like I've gotten my point across <laughs> of what God's given me to say. And uh, I won't delay you any further. But I appreciate your attention tonight to God's word and what he's given me. And uh, I'm praying for you guys and around, uh, around this time that God would give you guys comfort and peace and that he would allow his presence to flood into your home on Christmas Day like it has never before. Amen. God bless you.